My name is Marquette Finning. I'm going to tell you a story. Good morning, everyone. Good so, morning. Hello, everyone. I am Carmen DeBono, and welcome to our series, Il Maltin Tana, presented by the Maltese Center of New York, featuring conversations with people who do extraordinary things from politics to medicine, personalities to professors, artists to writers, each guest sharing his or her experience and accomplishments. Our guest today was born and raised in Canada, the youngest of five, and began storytelling as early as four years old to becoming a published author of two historical novels, The Eight Points Across and the recently re released Falcon Shadow, both holding number one and number two spots on Amazon's bestseller list. Martez, thank you for joining us here today on Il Malpintana. Thank you so much. A, you're welcome. It's been quite a year for you with both of your books reaching the bestsellers list. Tell me about that. So that, that kind of came as a, a surprise, well, a, a planned surprise, I suppose. So um, when um, my, so my first novel was published in, in 2011 and, and it, it, did, it did relatively well. It's published by a small house. Um, I didn't have a marketing machine behind me. And to be perfectly frank, I had no idea what I was doing as far as marketing goes. Um, so, you know, I, I enjoyed relatively small success with, with my first novel and continued working on writing the sequel. And then um, of course COVID struck and I just, I had planned to release my first novel again uh, as a second edition in, in anticipation of the release of the sequel. Um, and so as I was working on um, the second edition of the first book, I started just paying attention to people's Facebook posts and sort of their lamentations about being stuck at home, being bored, needing an escape. And I remember thinking, you know, I wish I could do something. I wish I could help. I'm not a frontline worker. I mean, I'm kind of just staying home, doing my part to not to flatten the curve. And so I decided when I released the second edition, I'm going to drop the price across all platforms to make it an affordable escape for people who are stuck at home, who are struggling with boredom. And all of a sudden, I noticed a huge jump in the rankings of, of my first novel from, I don't know, somewhere in the hundred thousands on the Amazon bestseller list to like 52. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is something special. This is incredible. And so um, I started a push, uh, you know, campaigning on online um, to create a bit of a buzz. And, and within weeks, the my first novel hit number one on the Amazon bestsellers list. And I was, I was floored, I was ecstatic, I was Muppet flailing, I was just over the moon, uh, just totally joyful. And um, so because I felt, you know, it, it was in part due to the pandemic, in part due to, you know, people are, are bored at home and they're, they're reading more. I needed to do something with the, the proceeds uh, that I had earned from that surge in sales. So I donated uh, the proceeds from that surge to Conquer COVID-19 charities that help uh, Ontario charities that are fighting fighting the virus. So, so that was my... Um, my rise uh, up the bestseller list with my first book and then Falcon Shadow was released in July and I think that beautiful wave of momentum carried my second novel straight to the bestsellers list so within hours of its release it had also hit number one and at one point I had Falcon's Shadow at number one and Eight Pointed Cross at number two on the bestseller list. And I just thought, oh, wow, I've, I, I felt so validated as, as a writer. Um, it was just like this culmination of so many years work um, in, in, this, in this moment. And it was just extraordinary. Well, congratulations. COVID did a, got a positive out of that for you and mm -hmm. also the charities mm -hmm. for, that you wanted to raise the money. So tell me about a, a bit about where you were raised and um, how Malta was part of your upbringing. Absolutely. So I, I'm born in Toronto, Canada, um, but 
my household is extremely Maltese. My, my parents spoke Maltese at home. I spoke Maltese before I spoke English. Um, and we would travel back and forth to Malta often. I believe I was three three months old the first time I, I visited Malta. I've obviously no recollection of that. Um, but I do distinctly remember summer spent in Malta and um, the narrow lanes and the, and the dusty streets and um, just always thinking that traveling to Malta meant traveling back in time. It meant, you know, getting to wander through this living museum, because really when you, when you look at Malta and these structures that have existed for millennia, and in fact, some of the, the temples, uh, the, the oldest freestanding structures in the world, they predate the pyramids of Egypt. It's just so fascinating and always has been to me. And then of course, uh, my parents would constantly be telling me stories about life in Malta back when they were young. And uh, it just totally drew my fascination, this little island um, and its resilience and its storied past. It's just such a rich tapestry of history and triumph. And uh, yeah, so, so I, I grew up with that and just found it extremely fascinating and, and it drew me back again and again. So I would, even when I was, you know, working and, and no longer reliant on my parents to fly me to Malta, I would elect to fly there on my own. And um, of course, you know, part of part of traveling to Malta included the beach life and the and the bar hopping in the evening. But more than that, it was just immersing in the culture and the history that was just so rich for me. So your experiences um, going to Malta and so forth, were you always a writer and always had this idea of writing about Malta at some point in your writing um, career? Well, I definitely always knew that whatever path I took in life, it would have to involve writing. Um, that's one thing I'm relatively decent at and just something I've always had this innate desire to do. Um, Malta though, I, 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 okay, so I'll back up and again, loved, I always loved history. I was always drawn to that genre, whether it was books or movies, it was always something I loved. Um, so I do believe that historical fiction would always have been the genre that I would have tackled as a writer, but it wasn't until a trip I took in 2000, so 20 years ago, um, when, I, when I was visiting Malta, Again, just with the intention of beaching and, and, and having fun uh, in Pacheville with friends. Um, one of my friends who's from the Netherlands was also visiting while I was there. And she suggested on one afternoon, hey, let's go check out the Malta experience. And I hadn't seen it. So I said, yeah, why not? Let's go. So we, we hopped on a bus, went to Valletta, and we watched this um, just audio visual masterpiece that depicts the island's incredible history and I, I will never forget the moment I, I was sitting in that theater and the when the siege of 1565 played out on the screen I was speechless I, I I had known about the siege but I didn't know just quite what it entailed and and how incredible a victory that was for Malta just how the odds were so very much stacked against this little island. And I thought, how has this story, you know, not been told in, in a way that isn't just kind of like a history fact dropping type of narrative. Like this needs to be told in an entertaining way because what an epic underdog story. And it was in that moment that I thought, well, you know, you want, you want to be a writer here's some amazing material for you to tackle. So it was then that I knew this is gonna be my, my life's work. Um, and it's been a 20 year journey um, and it's still going, but that, that was the moment that it began. And I, I can still very specifically remember that moment. I remember everything about it. And I remember what I was wearing. I remember all of it. So it's just very much imprinted. Uh, on my mind and and that's yeah that was the birth of <laughs> of this journey so as i was reading um the the eight points across um it is very apparent there was a lot of research and immersion involved with this book um so during your research what were some of the things that you discovered or were surprised by that you believe were little known but you were able to put into your novel 
So th there was a lot to unpack. When I started first researching the siege, I focused primarily on the great siege of 1565. But as I delved into, you know, what, what caused this siege? Like what, what led the Ottoman Empire to kind of set their sights on Little Malta? Um, why was that such a big deal to them to conquer? And the further back I went, I started to see this other siege and all this, this these other factors that led to the great siege, um, like the siege of 1551, which is when um, the Ottomans, they had initially attacked Imdina because they thought, okay, we're going to take Malta, but Imdina managed to fend them off. And then Dragut, who is a, a, a very well-known incredible Ottoman seaman set his sights on Gozo, which was very poorly defended at the time. Um, and effectively he managed to empty the entire island of its population. He left, I believe it was 12 elderly men as a warning to the rest of Malta and the Knights that this is what happens when you trouble the realm of Sultan Suleiman. Um, and I thought, now that is a story that isn't well known. And so that will serve as the impetus for my first novel. And initially my plan was to write one novel, but as I started learning all this amazing history and all of these other pivotal battles that took place, I thought, well, no, this, <laughs> this is going to take more than one book. And that, that's how it ended up becoming the trilogy that it is. Yeah. Interesting. I know that was going to be my next, next question <laughs> was, when you know when you were writing this, did you know you were going to build upon each book, or you thought you were just going to have one standalone book? And when that decision happened, but as you explained, you saw there was just so much uh, more to this that it wouldn't be a standalone book. So you chose to write a trilogy, correct? That's right. Yeah, because the the first book just got so massive and. And at that point, I had only just written the siege of 1551, and I'm like, okay, so I still have to cover the Zwar siege, the Jerba siege, and then the Great Siege. How am I going to do that? It's, it's going to end up being this big. Nobody's going to read it. Um, so at the time, I had a literary agent, and I, I proposed to him, maybe we split this into two books. What do you think? Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. It won't be marketable if you just write this massive double Bible length novel. Um, so then it was going to be two books. But then again, the second book just got way too big. Um, and so I so then I settled on a, a trilogy. And that, that doesn't mean there might not be a fourth or fifth book in the works in the future. But as of right now, it's, it's the trilogy. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I think you're muted. Yes. So okay. I noticed when you began the novel, right away you begin with a child, Domenicus, mm -hmm. and who's a young Maltese peasant. Why did why did you choose a child to be the opening character in Eight Points Across? Well, I think um, my plans were to have Domenicus and his younger sister Katrina kind of carry the story, like the the entire trilogy. So. I had them as children in the beginning of the first book because I wanted them to be of an age when the siege happened, that they would be young enough and able-bodied enough to, um, to play pivotal roles, but not too young that they, you know, couldn't contribute. So it was, it was just strategic in the sense that I, I wanted them to carry this entire story uh, and I, I wanted their age to fit with each book uh, to be age appropriate for, for what would be demanded of them at the time. Although that being said, um, during the Great Siege, children did actually take part in the fighting. They did um, gather cannonballs. They did pour incendiary uh, tar on the enemy. So, I mean, children lost their childhood during the siege. There, there were no more children. They all had to become adults. However, um, I, I wanted, to frame all three of my books through the lens of these two particular characters. So I figured I would start them young and then they would grow up during this rather tumultuous time. And while we were speaking about characters, they are so well-developed and the descriptions are so vivid and intertwined with your accurate portrayal of the history of the time. So did you immerse yourself in any of these locations or the roles of the characters that you created? Absolutely. That's my favorite form of research because, well, yes, 
reading um, and research and uh, con consultations with historians is really effective and really valuable. For me personally, there's nothing like total immersion. Um, just getting a sense of a place, its paces, its smells, its the vibrancy of the people, speaking with the people, kind of observing them, understanding their nuances and what makes them tick and uh, what quirks they have. So I did travel to pretty much every location where my books are set. Um, Malta, of course, uh, having, having practically grown up there, um, I, I had a pretty strong, um, well from which to draw uh, of, of Malta. Although I did, I still went back to, to do some research there at like the time I was there in 2007. And I thought, you know, I should, um, I should try to experience what it feels like to be on, on a fortress wall during a siege under, you know, the midsummer sun. Now let's see how that feels. And so I, I went to Birgu, the site of St. Angelo, and I stood on this fortress wall from probably 1 p.m. till about 3 p.m. So the hottest, hottest time of day, it was August. We were in the midst of a heat wave. I didn't pack enough water and it was just me and my notebook. And I stood on this battlement for two hours and just described what I was feeling. So where the sweat was pooling and how was my heart racing? How was my breathing? I just really wanted to get a sense of what it might have felt like to stand on a wall, which was effectively a stone oven um, under this just beating sun. Um, and I wasn't in armor. I mean, the knights were clad in like a hundred pounds of armor. I was in a summer dress. And anyways, <laughs> I wrote detailed notes and then I got on the bus, went home, and then I suffered heat stroke for two days. I spent the next two days curled up in bed, praying for death. It was horrendous. But I can honestly say that my scenes benefited from that experience because I was now able to really write what it felt like for me to stand in that unrelenting heat. And, and again, I wasn't in armor, um, so I can only Im imagine what the defenders felt during, during that time while, while they're on those fortress walls. Um, in the summer and also they're they're battling with incendiary weapons so you had fire hoops you had cannonballs you had uh matchlock guns going off gunpowder just explosions <laughs> it was, oh my goodness so um so that was one experience in which i completely completely immersed um and i also had the privilege of traveling to istanbul which is an absolutely extraordinary beautiful uh, city. It's just, it's history come to life. The, the mosques are works of art and there is not a street corner that just doesn't have some storied, beautiful past. Um, so I also just wandered everywhere I could. I, I um, went to, to, uh, to visit Topkapi Palace several times and I would just sit in the garden. Um, Istanbul is known for its, its roses. And so I would find a rose garden and just sit in the rose garden and breathe in the smells of Istanbul and, and write notes. I had this predated smartphones. So I had a notebook and a pen with me and I would just take it everywhere I went and, and write detailed notes and and yeah, just immerse and, and be quiet and watch and observe and eat the food. And I, I really do think that my time in Istanbul gained me about 10 pounds because the food is, oh, sensational. Um, so, so yeah, so th that was basically my method was just go to the place and, and immerse and talk to people, talk to locals, get to know them. Um, people are extremely excited when you visit them and ask them about their culture and their history. I have never met a person who wasn't so very forthcoming and just excited to share with me and excited about the project that I was working on. So they, they want to help you. I, I back in, backtracking to Malta, I, I had visited St. Lawrence Church in Birgu and I uh, started chatting with the caretaker. And when he found out why I was there and, and what I was doing, he spoke to me for probably an hour, an hour and a half about the history of Malta and the Knights of St. John. And yeah, it was, it's just, it's, people are so um, generous and giving with information because I think we're all so happy when someone takes an interest in, in something that we love and that we find special. So um, 
yeah, I was able to not only just immerse in the in the landscape and the historical sites, but really connect with the, the people as well. Yeah, uh, talking about Turkey, um, also in your book, you have your character uh, Demir, a <laughs> young Ottoman, um, and that's also another um, point that I enjoy about your book is you're giving us a perspective of the other side. It's always Malta and the Turks coming, the Ottomans coming to Malta, but we get to see this other side, what's occurring in the Ottomans' um, lives, and you bring that into the books, which I thought was fascinating because the focus was always Malta and their experiences, and it's always, oh, the, you know, the Ottomans are coming, you know, these, you know, enemies, but um, with Demir, you, you become empathetic to their plight during this time. And I thought that was a wonderful um, uh, way to make your novel stand out from all the others. And I thought it was just a great way of explaining that part of history that we really don't get to see in, in this uh, historical time. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And that was definitely one of the goals when I when I started writing these books was I want to be fair to both sides. Um, everybody does believe they're on the right side. You wouldn't take up a cause if you didn't believe you were you were fighting on the side of righteousness. And so my goal was to show that, you know, there are villains and heroes on on both sides. Um, and I wanted my readers to root for characters on both sides and and care about characters on both sides and see things from the perspective of the people on both sides of the proverbial battlefield because like I said everybody kind of does the best they can with the knowledge that they have or the knowledge that they're fed and um it was just it was so extremely important to me to uh to show that balance and to um to be fair to both sides and, and give both sides a voice. Um, and and I'm, I'm really happy to hear that, that I did accomplish that. So thank you. And um, are any of the characters based on real people? I've come to grasp on to Katrina um, just from the very beginning when she cuts her hair off. Um, <laughs> and I don't know all of it, but yeah, pretty short. And, you know, as a defiance to the forced roles of women of the time and showing her independence right at the very beginning. So just curious, are any of the characters based on real people? I mean, I definitely identify with, uh, you know, Katerina. So if you wanted to, you know, give us some information. Yes, absolutely. So um, I would say Katrina is, is pretty much loosely based on my own personality. Um, she's defiant, she's gritty, she's somewhat vulgar, uh, she defies social norms, and that's kind of always been my personality. But I'll say this, in, uh, in the last few years, women who've emailed me, reached out to me about my books, have all seen to identify with Katrina. And that means so much to me. And especially Maltese women, I'm finding, I think we all have a little bit of Katrina in us. I think we all want to defy these um, society imposed norms. You know, I think, I think we all want to chop off our hair sometimes and take up archery and kick some butt. Um, and so uh, as much as I, I did base Katrina somewhat loosely on myself, I now, I kind of believe she just belongs to all of us. She's sort of every Maltese or non-Maltese woman who, um, you know, wants to do her own thing, wants to learn things, wants to, aspires to, to be something. Um, I think we all, we can all take ownership of Katrina. So I, I no longer feel as though she belongs to me exclusively. I think, I think she's all of ours. Any other characters that were based on real people or inspired by real people? Oh yes, absolutely. And I, I just, I found that um, in observing people, sometimes someone might have, you know, a little thing about their personality and I'll, I'll metamorphose that into a character. Um, I, I like to people watch. And, um, and so I've had whole characters born from that. Um, but like Father Tabone, who is um, like a champion of, 
stray animals. Um, my mother used to always tell me stories about her father, uh, John, and he was known around my mom's village of Burzabuja uh, for having a like a, a pack of stray dogs trailing him everywhere he went because he would feed them with uh, the scraps from wealthy tables. So he had this whole wolf pack. And I just found that so endearing. And I, I myself absolutely love dogs. Um, so I thought, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give that part of my grandfather's personality to Father to Bone. So the priest in my books also has uh, a pack of dogs that trail, trail him everywhere he goes. And um, not to give away too much, but in my second novel in Falcon's Shadow, you get a little bit of, of Father to Bone's actual backstory. And um, so of course I, I worked in my own dog. So my, my Siberian Husky has a little cameo um, as one of the dogs in, in Father to Bone's original wolf pack. Um, so yeah, so there's those characters. And then there's, you know, I, when I was in Istanbul, I had met a shopkeeper who, he was just like extremely kind and friendly and he wasn't hitting on me, which was really wonderful. Um, and so he had this really endearing list, just like a lovely guy. And I, I included him as a character. He's actually uh, the character Morad, who is Demir's best friend of my Istanbul characters. Um, Morad is based on, on this shopkeeper in Istanbul. Um, a character that you'll meet in Falcon's Shadow named Manu, he is uh, based on this like ab absurdly tall Frenchman I met in Germany many years ago. And uh, it was just nothing other than the height and the kind of affable, jovial demeanor. And from there I created this, this character, Manu. So yeah, it's, it's funny, people, do sort of familiar people find their way into my book? Uh, some are more obvious than others, but but yeah, they're in there. Even even my dog. <laughs> and what, in regards to the eight-pointed cross, um, it's not your typical eight-pointed cross where we always know it's made of a precious metal like uh, gold or silver or something. And this one is turquoise, and it's ex you know it's explained in the novel. And um, it is the cover of the book. How did you come to create the eight points across in turquoise? Is there any um, significance to that? Um, well, basically, so it's it's given to uh, Augustine, who's the patriarch of the family that I write about, by a knight when he's a little boy. And the gold and silver crosses are, are reserved for the knights. Um, but because Augustine is a peasant, the knight who gifts it to him um, chooses to give him the turquoise because of the sort of societal restrictions on a peasant wearing a gold or silver cross. So not much more to it than that. And also I just, it, I thought it looked really pretty on the cover. <laughs> well, to me, that's something new. Um, right. I didn't really know it was just reserved, you know, and there was like a status symbol on, you know, what material the a point across was uh, made for. And did you hide any secrets in your books that only a few people will find, or do you want to divulge any of that? Um, there, there might be a few little Easter eggs in there for for the the history buffs, but um, no, nothing, nothing really is is jumping out at me um, as far as intentional secrets. Um, in my research process, you know, I did try to pay attention to. What were the purveying um, thoughts or, or complaints of the day? And I, so I try to work that in, um, but not much as far as, as kind of hidden, hidden gems or anything like that, no. And so are you a full-time writer or part-time writer or are you balancing um, two professions? Um, tell us a little more about that. Yeah, so I, I kind of consider myself a full-time writer with uh, a side gig. And my, my side gig would be that I'm also a teacher. I'm a high school teacher. I choose to work contract to contract. So I have, I have not gone uh, permanent. There's something that terrifies me about being permanently tethered to, to a workplace. Um, so I, I do tend to bounce around, but I've been pretty consistent in the last... I've been teaching for 12 years, so I've been pretty consistent in the schools that I will contract myself to. And I, I just recently finished um, a wonderful uh, contract with my former high school, actually. Um, and I was working with um, the developmentally delayed multiple exceptionality students. And what a gift. Um, 
what a gift working with with these uh, young men and women. They're they're just so pure and um, without pretense and without artifice. And um, it was such a joy uh, getting to work with these with these students. And uh, it was an emotional parting, uh, I have to say. I spent spent much of my last day working with them in tears <laughs> because I did develop some attachments. And uh, so now I'm, I'm back to supply teaching. Uh, there's no shortage of work given given COVID. Um, it's, it's been a difficult run for teachers. Um, the demands placed on them right now are pretty monumental. Uh, so, so there's no shortage of work as far as supply teaching goes. Uh, but I've fortunately, I've been able to stay on at the school where I just finished my contract in a supply teaching role. So I still get to see my kids on a daily basis, which really makes me happy. Um, it buoys me up. They're just, they're just so wonderful. And I find there's, there's just so much to learn from those students. Um, you know, uh, they're, like I said, they're just, there's no artifice, there's no facade, there's no hidden agenda. It's just, it's all real. And I love that so much. So as an educator, um, and when you were in school, was, were there, was there a teacher or a mentor that um, helped your writing grow to become what it is? Or was it mainly um, something natural for you or something in the family that you grew up with and was supported by? Um, how did that all evolve? So I would say all of the above. Um, I was so fortunate to be raised in a family where art and creativity was nurtured. Um, my father ran a um, Maltese television show for decades, like long before I was born. Um, so he had so much experience in broadcast. Um, my, my brothers are really creative all in their own right. My, my brother Lou is a history professor in the US. Um, my brother Steve is a photographer. He also writes. Um, he works as a director at the Shopping Channel. My brother Dave also writes. He's also a teacher. My sister is the science buff of the family. Um, but she actually, she read The Hobbit to me when I was just a, a little girl, which really kind of piqued my interest in, in fantasy and epics. Um, and my mom would always tell me stories when I was growing up as well. Uh, she kind of tended to focus more on the, the biblical stories, <laughs> but, uh, but still there was always storytelling. Um, and so, I, and, and my love of writing was always nurtured at home. I was never discouraged. Um, and then in school as well, I was so fortunate to have really wonderful teachers growing up who um, I guess they sensed my love of, of creative writing and, and they nurtured it very much. Um, I'll never forget my grade six teacher once on a, a story I had written as a class assignment wrote, great creativity. Um, I cannot wait to be standing in line for an autograph on your latest bestseller. And I was 11 or 12 years old when I got that note and that had stuck with me forever. Um, it's amazing the impact that, that a teacher can have on you. And, and even in high school, um, English was the subject in which I excelled, English and history. And, um, and my teachers were always really encouraging and, and really pushing me. They would read my, my stories, even stories that I wrote that weren't assignment. And I would inflict my stories on my teachers. And now as a teacher, uh, with the amount of marking that we have to do, I look back and I'm like, oh, I can't believe I, I did that to my ear. Here's more stuff for you to read. <laughs> but they would, they would read it and they would give me feedback. And I mean, that that really did set me on this trajectory. So I'm so grateful. Um, I, I've been extremely blessed um, to have had a family, friends and teachers who have just been incredibly nurturing. I've never really encountered um, discouragement. I mean, that being said, you do get discouraged by, you know, publishers at times, but, you know, I, I had a strong foundation, so um, the discouragement didn't last long. So with all your experiences, um, growing up and knowing writing was your number one passion and creating these books, what was the one thing that you did that was out of your comfort zone to achieve this? You know, I'll say writing, I've always been comfortable, me and either a paper and pen or, or I guess a laptop, that's always been my comfort zone. Out of my comfort zone is this kind of thing. <laughs> so the, the, um, 
doing interviews, doing any kind of self-promotion has always made me a little uncomfortable. Um, I'm just not a good salesperson. Uh, so I, I don't like to push anything on anyone. I don't generally talk too much about it unless asked. And then if you ask, well, then I'm a fountain that's just <laughs> going and going and gushing. Um, but yeah, so for me, uh, I think really the, the uh, biggest learning curve has been the marketing piece, the uh, self-promotion, the put yourself out there, be seen, be heard. Um, that's been the most challenging for me. I'm getting more comfortable with it because, you know, this is, this is the way it is. I mean, if, if you don't promote yourself, there's very few people that are going to promote you. These days, publishers really don't do a whole lot, if anything. Um, they kind of just expect you to, to carry all the weight of the promotional stuff. So that's been a lot for me to learn. And COVID kind of gave me the time because I wasn't working um, for the first part of the pandemic. I was at home working on my book and then doing webinars and seminars and uh, consultations with, with media experts just to learn how to navigate um, this aspect of writing because the writing part while I am always learning and I'm, I'm always practicing and, and trying to develop my craft um, that part I feel like I have down or at least I know how to get better whereas this 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 machine <laughs> I'm still learning and um, and so I'm definitely a work in progress well I'm very impressed by you and I would never know that this is your you know discomfort zone. <laughs> um, I find you very fascinating and Thank you. Uh, reading about you, you're actually quite adventurous. Um, you know, you're always up to trying new things. And I know you took up archery because of your experience and immersion with the book. Is that correct? Yes, that's true. So when I was writing my dear Katrina, um, she wanted to learn archery and, and learning she would, but for me, um, having to then write her learning archery, I had to learn because how do I write effectively about something that I don't know how to do? And certainly how do I teach the thing that I don't know how to do? Um, so I, I ended up signing up for a uh, archery course, which took place at the University of Toronto uh, many years ago. And I thought it was just going to be sort of a a workshop on learning how to knock and shoot an arrow and, and shoot at targets and all that stuff. But what it actually ended up being was a become a certified archery instructor course. So I did this um, really intense weekend and learned all of these skills. And most importantly, I learned how to teach archery. So when I had to write the scenes where somebody was teaching Katrina archery, well, I knew how to do that now. And I ended up being rewarded with a certified archery instructor certificate, which was completely by accident, but it's pretty cool. <laughs> See? Look at that. <laughs> I have to take up archery and see. It's that honestly, goes. it is so much fun. I had the opportunity to do it again. Um, my husband and I relocated temporarily to Singapore for a while. And um, you can only stay so long before you have to leave again to renew your visa. So we would take these weekend trips to Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia. And on one weekend in Indonesia, we got to do some archery, which was which was pretty neat. I have to say, I really enjoyed that. And I do believe I got the bullseye that day. <laughs> and then uh, a couple of years later, our friends and, and myself and my husband did uh, what's called archery tag, which is sort of like paintball, except you're armed with a bow and arrow and you're trying to, to shoot your competition. And it, oh man, is that ever fun? Wear a jock strap to any of the men that <laughs> <laughs> want to take part our our neighbor had a little incident but um it, it is such a blast and my my archery skills uh proved pretty effective so so that was wonderful so that was all that was born out of the the novel absolutely and, and just doing the archery tag kind of gave me a sense of what it might have felt like in an actual battle to knock and shoot an arrow while you're being shot at because it's one thing to learn how to do something, and then it's another thing to do that when people are, are trying to harm you. So yeah, it was, it was great. And again, it worked its way into my novel. So not everything is deliberate. Nothing has been an accident. So as you know, the, uh, the point of the series is to spotlight uh, Maltese people uh, or 
Maltese people living abroad or Maltese people born abroad and kind of highlight their passions and their accomplishments. And I want to bring up um, about, you know, Malta and Maltese community abroad. And what are some of the important issues that concern you now within the Maltese community that live abroad or were raised abroad and um, trying to maintain that identity? Well, I, I think it's so important for, um, you know, first generation parents, if they speak the language to pass that on to their children, because what a gift it is um, to learn any second language, but to be able to learn one in the home is, it is, it's a gift. And the fact that I was raised able to speak Maltese opened up many opportunities for me um, as far as travel, as far as learning other languages, because I, I do find just from personal experience, when you speak two languages, learning a third becomes a little bit easier, learning a fourth becomes even easier. Um, so, you know, when I, when I was uh, visiting Morocco, their uh, form of Arabic is really similar to the Maltese that we speak. And so I was able to understand pretty much everything that was being said around me. And I was able to know when a merchant was trying to swindle me because I could understand. Um, so I, I just think it's so important for, um, for the language to, to be maintained. Um, I would really love to see, you know, local Maltese communities supporting one another, supporting each other's accomplishments. Um, like what you're doing here is so beautiful. You're connecting um, Maltese people from across the globe uh, to just chat and, and, um, and yeah, and connect. And it, it, you know, gives a human face to, uh, to the population. It's really lovely what you're doing, Carmen. Um, I think, um, yeah, we just, we need to celebrate each other and we really need to dig into our history. It is a beautiful history. Um, and there's, there's just so many fascinating things about, uh, about Malta. And I really encourage, you know, the diaspora or uh, people born, Maltese people that are born uh, abroad to go home, to go visit, um, to wander those narrow lanes, to eat food, to smell the air, to connect with the Maltese, to uh, support the local artisans. It's just, it's, it, it's such a beautiful place to be. Um, and I just, I find the, the, again, back to the history, it just, it's such a, a resilient people that make up Malta. And um, I think, you know, we, we just, we can't lose that. You know, we have to keep telling the stories and, and keep the momentum going and, and celebrate each other and, and continue to connect. And I, I think that that's what I would love to see to continue. Well, on that note, um, to stay connected, as you know, the series um, also offers a Q and A with our audience. Um, which we will begin. And um, I will ask everybody to, you know, be patient. Um, as you know, this is my second uh, series and I'm trying to manage um, multiple things here. And I will ask everybody to, um, they can either go on video or submit th through a chat and I will take them and then um, submit them to you, Martez, and you can answer them as they come in to you. So um, I will do, you know, one question and Martez will answer the other. Um, and please be patient. It seems like the um, internet is um, being a little pokey, I think, on both ends, but uh, we'll work it out. Okay, so we will go with our first question. It's from, um, let me pull this up. Uh, it's from Julie. When is Mars' third book coming out? <laughs> Thank you for that question. Um, so third book is written. Um, it's in the editing process at the moment. However, um, I, I find writing the end is an emotional experience. So that being said, I have yet to write the epilogue of the third book. In, initially, my plan was to finish the third book, but let it breathe for you know, a few months before I wrote the epilogue because I wanted to create a little bit of disconnect between myself and the main body of the story. Um, and then the, uh, write the epilogue, which is gonna be set about five years later. 
Um, but now I, I almost have this feeling of, oh, once I write that epilogue, it's, it's really done. <laughs> so there's sort of this sense of, of wanting to put it off just a little longer. But I, I will I'll probably tackle that in the next couple months. Um, I'm thinking the third book in the trilogy will probably come out uh, in 2022. So I'm going to give myself next year to um, just continue with the edits, rigorous, hard, you know, merciless editing. And then I will, um, and then I will have it, have it out in 2022. And I'm thinking I might release it uh, in May to coincide with the anniversary of the start of the Great Siege of 1565, which which commenced in May of 1565. So I'm, I'm thinking that, look for it around May, 2022. <laughs> I wanted to add that Julie uh, also, her comment came in a, a little later after I asked that question. She said she's such a fan with uh, multiple exclamation <laughs> points and the cliffhangers are killers. <laughs> All right, so our next question is from Anita. How difficult is it to get published and what is that process? Okay, so getting published is a pride swallowing siege. It is difficult. Um, you basically have to take your ego and just check it because while you are probably confident in your work and people who've read it are telling you it's amazing and you know what it probably is, incredible. The gatekeepers are really hard to please. Um, so you just have to develop a thick skin and know that one rejection, a hundred rejections, it doesn't mean you'll never be published. It doesn't mean stop trying. You just have to keep at it. It's, it is, it's challenging it, and, and commit to the long haul. Know that it's going to be challenging. Know that you're going to feel crappy sometimes and you're going to want to give up, but don't. You know, writers, you are, you're a passionate breed and, and you care deeply about your work and you just, you have to keep pushing it. Um, typically the process involves landing an agent. So just kind of like, like an athlete or an actor has an agent, writers have to have, not have to, sorry, pardon me. Writers often have agents because agents help you get in the door at the publisher. Um, very, very rarely will a publisher accept an unsolicited, unagented manuscript. It usually ends up in what's called the slush pile, which is essentially a, a, a garbage pile. Um, that being said, J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter did end up in a slush pile, but was picked up. And well, we all know the story of Harry Potter. Um, but yeah, so typically you'll find yourself an agent and the agent will shop your book around. Um, I've had two literary agents in the past. Um, my second literary agent got me very, very close with, with big name publishers in New York City. Um, and you know, with, with each hoop you jump through, you think, oh, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. And then you know, maybe one person on that team says, oh, but I don't know how to market this. I don't know where to place this. I don't know who will buy this. This or whatever, whatever objection they'll raise. And then that's it. And you're done. And you have to start from scratch. So again, you have to commit to the long haul. You have to accept that it's hard. It's hard. Um, and I mean, if you don't want to go the traditional route, um, you can self-publish. Uh, it's become a lot easier these days to self-publish. And there are self-published authors who do achieve success. So self-publishing is also an option. Um, so yeah, but I mean, it's, it is, it is a difficult process um, and, and you probably will cry. I'm so sorry, <laughs> but you know, that's, that's just unfortunately the reality of the publishing world. Okay, our next question is from Christine. Thank you for sharing today. Can you tell us more about your journey in becoming a best-selling author specifically? Um, okay, so I mean that was like I, I like I had said earlier, becoming a, a bestseller was something I I don't think I had um, planned for initially. I, I just thought that was something way out of the realm of possibility for me. Um, my my publisher is a small publisher; it doesn't have this like big um, backing. It doesn't really uh, move in the media. It's not well known. So becoming a bestseller just, it didn't really, wasn't a blip on my radar. Um, 
But I just kind of learned that through connecting with readers, through building a mailing list, um, keeping a blog, just engaging, you know, constantly engaging with readers and potential readers uh, and putting myself out there, maybe out of my comfort zone, um, was very helpful in creating a buzz um, having word of mouth. So, you know, a friend would read my book and then tell a friend who tell a friend who tell a friend and on we go. Um, and so it was just, just kind of organically building a, a strong readership. Um, and then strategically it helped that, you know, when, when COVID struck, I dropped the price of my first novel to 99 cents. Um, and that launched it, up the sales ranking to number one. And then, that momentum carried uh, so that when my second book was released, it too hit number one because the first book then created enough interest in, well, what's going to happen next that the second book just sort of slid right into, into number one. Okay. And I just wanted to add from your fan, Julie, she said, this <laughs> series should be a movie and thank you for your brilliant work. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. I am so grateful for that. And that is, that is my wish. That is my, my, my deep abiding hope is that one day um, my books will be made into films. I can kind of picture who I would like to see cast, although that changes almost daily. Um, I, I've got the soundtrack in my head. Um, I can see myself accepting an Academy Award for Best Adapted Screenplay. Um, so yeah, th th I would, if, if any of my hopes or dreams could manifest, that would definitely be one of them, would be to see these books make it into, uh, into film. Because I mean, just, I'm just thinking of like the jobs that would create in Malta, the attention that would bring to Malta, because naturally they would have to be shot there. And um, just thinking of like, people who've gone to uh, New Zealand to see where Lord of the Rings was filmed or who've hopped around to see the various sites of Game of Thrones. Like how wonderful to have my work cause, uh, create such, such a, a buzz around Malta. I, I think that would be extraordinary. Yes, I would definitely look forward to that too and definitely want to be uh, invited to the <laughs> opening. Um, Absolutely, you're all invited. <laughs> Uh, your next question is from Nikki. Do you plan to write more books? And if so, will you write about the same historical era in Malta or about something else? Um, it's a two-part question, so I'll leave that question first for you to answer. Okay. Um, so, you know what? Uh, when I had finished my third book, or just about finished my third book, I thought, I need a break. <laughs> I'm tired. It's been 20 years that I've been working on this project. Um, but then, you know, I had that little, yeah, but you know, you can, you can take some of the characters that you finished off in the third book that maybe had a bit of a minor role and kind of springboard them into another novel. So I am toying with the idea of writing a fourth book, which would center around the Battle of Lepanto, which happened in 1571. So six years after the, the Great Siege of Malta and um, the Knights of St. John were involved in that battle. So I am, I am toying with that idea. And I'm also tinkering with the idea of writing a prequel to A Pointed Cross, which would kind of center mostly on Augustine's story and the Knight's rule of uh, the Island Roads. So I've got two, two novels that I am thinking about. Um, I do believe historical fiction is kind of my, my niche. Um, so I, I do think I would stick, stick with this genre. Even if, I, if those two novels weren't next for me to write, I do believe I would still stick with the historical genre because I just love it so much. And I've got all this research, <laughs> all this knowledge crammed in here now. I feel like I need to use it. And the second part of the question was um, backtracking. It was about um, about having it made to a movie so we can skip that. She said you answered that second question. Um, you're, I'm gonna make this the last question. Um, it's from Brad. Having achieved bestseller status, would you relish the thought of a boot? It's also about a movie being made <laughs> out of your story. Yes. <laughs> and if so, who was your vision? They want to know who is your vision for Augustine? Oh, okay. So this is kind of funny. So when I first started writing Eight Pointed Cross, I, I was still like a huge fan of the movie Braveheart 
particularly the the character, uh, or well, he's a historical figure, um, Robert the Bruce. So the actor that played Robert the Bruce, Angus McFadden, I believe is the pronunciation. I had always pictured him as my Augustine. Um, I'm not sure if, if you guys can just Google him because <laughs> <laughs> he's not the most prominent. Um, he's done a few movies since, but that's kind of his iconic role, uh, which I do believe they've reprised because the movie Robert the Bruce actually came out um, this year. Uh, so he was my original Augustine. And then of course, I'm a huge Game of Thrones fan. So Sean Bean as Ned Stark kind of started to push um, <laughs> my Robert the Bruce actor out and it sort of became Ned Stark, uh, sorry, um, Sean Bean as, as my Augustine. So that's, that's who I would like to see in that role, I think. <laughs> I know when I read the when I um, got into A Pointed Cross, I mean, it, just like I said, the, the vividness of everything and I, I, I saw it play out, you know, on the big screen, but I always prefer the books, honestly. Um, and I don't mind seeing the movie, but I always tell everybody the book is always better than the movie, but we all, we all like to see things on the well, big the, screen The beauty well. of the book um, is you can actually get inside the character's head in a way that you can't in a movie. Like, I can't really know what you're thinking. I mean, your facial expression might convey a sense of what you're thinking, but to really kind of get inside your thoughts, I find the book is, is the perfect vehicle for that. I agree, I agree. Um, it, I'm gonna wrap up. Uh, the Q and A, um, we're just about in the hour mark. And I wanna thank you so much for participating in this initiative um, so we can keep our Maltese community together and to spotlight on um, people like you in our Maltese community and support you. And it seems like your family were definitely very supportive of you and um, the broader Maltese community. And I so enjoyed having you here and talking about your books and your accomplishment. And I look forward to um, having you um, again in the future and profiling you um, when your third book comes out or even before that. Um, and I wanna know if you have anything else to say to the Maltese community and what we can all be doing, as you know, um, supporting each other during these times. Absolutely, there was the one point that I wanted to make was um, in all of my research about the great siege, one point that really just was, my pride totally swelled when I read this was that um, on both sides, so Ottoman soldiers and knights, you had uh, both sides desert to the other. So you had Ottoman soldiers desert their army to join the knights, you had knights desert the knighthood to join the Ottomans. But there is not one single record of a Maltese citizen defecting to join the other side. The Maltese stayed true, every last one of them. They fought to the death to um, preserve and protect their homeland. And that resonated so deeply with me. And I think that's something from which we should take an immense amount of pride. It's like, we're long haulers, we're, we're loyal, we're, we're gritty, and we're, we're in it. And um, I love that. I so love that. And so, so that's, that would be my, my final message is just like, take pride in that. Love that about our little, our little island. It's just, it's, the people are, are uh, resilient and uh and I, I really hope that you know we, we maintain that and we don't we don't lose that wow that's wonderful that actually hit me really in the heart knowing that not one multi-citizen defected um that 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 really means a lot and going so back in history and them having that pride and loyalty um it, it means a lot, especially today when, you know, things have become so global and uh, we're trying to, you know, preserve our identity. So thank you again, Martez. Um, and next week, our guest will be Magna's man, who will talk to us about the importance of preserving our Maltese collective memories. Um, and, and again, um, we are becoming such a global village and more than ever, it is important to preserve what makes us different from everyone else and they will show that importance and what we can do to preserve these memories that we have. Um, and that will be next Sunday. 
And for Martez, her books are available on Amazon, Eight Points Across and Falcon Shadow. And she does have a wonderful website. Um, she is a fascinating person and learned and accomplished so much. Um, it's at www.martezbenick.com. Um, if you are enjoying this series presented by the Maltese Center of New York, leave us a comment through our website. You can contact us there or on our Facebook page, Maltese Center New York. Again, thank you so much, Martez. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for spending your Sunday with me. I'm so grateful. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Have a great Sunday. Goodbye. Bye.